When it comes to in-space propulsion, our biggest limiting factor is energy density. Chemical fuels are great for getting off the ground, but rather limited when it comes to traveling in space. Sure, we can travel to other planets using chemical engines, but we are still looking at very long transit times. And chemical propellants suffer greatly from mass penalties. If you want to go faster, you need more fuel for your ship. More fuel adds more mass to your ship, meaning you now need more fuel, and so on. Because of this, we use chemical fuel sparingly, doing maneuvers at specific times to maximize their effects, as well as stealing energy from other planets by using slingshot maneuvers to go further and faster, things like that. Ultimately, we are also just trapped in the solar system if we only use chemical propellants. If we do want to go further and faster, we really need to mess with the energy contents of matter itself. Ideally, fusion drives would be a fantastic choice, High thrust, high efficiency, easy to source fuel. But sadly, fusion drives are still in the future. They are kinda near term, but not right now technology. Right now, our best bet is to use the other nuclear energy, fission. Long term viewers of this channel will already know about my favorite nuclear engine, Orion. I have talked about Orion a lot, so I won't go into details here. The long and short of it is using nuclear bombs in a series to push a spacecraft into space and at very high speeds. It's a very neat bit of technology, and I love it. Unfortunately, it's illegal to develop, because detonating nuclear bombs in space, for any reason unless everyone agrees with it, is a big no-no. For more on Orion, check out my videos Gigaton Bomb and Orion Nuclear Battleships. Links below. Another common nuclear engine is the nuclear thermal engine. A small reactor heats propellant, usually hydrogen, ammonia, or water, and it's blown through a nozzle, producing thrust. Nuclear thermal is the most likely to be used in the next decade or so. The sad truth of this engine, though, is that it's not just a concept. Nuclear thermal engines were tested as early as 1955, with multiple fully functional engines being built and tested. The United States shut down its nuclear thermal rocket development in 1973. In 2019, the US restarted development, but then cancelled it again in 2025. And will possibly ban all future development and make it a criminal offense to even have any of the research material on it. Why did the US do this? Well, many reasons, all of them stupid, which should just be NASA's motto for the last 20 years, honestly. Other countries are still developing nuclear thermal engines, so we can expect to see them in the future. I'll go more in depth in a future video. Scott Manley made a really good video on the subject if you would like to know more. All of this brings us to the main topic of this video, a nuclear engine that has great performance and efficiency, is not illegal, internationally anyways, the US might because the aforementioned stupid reasons, and most importantly, it can be developed right now, it doesn't require any new technologies or materials. I'm talking about fission fragment rockets. This design is similar to a nuclear thermal rocket, but instead of using the reactor to heat up working fluid, the nuclear fuel itself is used as a propellant directly. Instead of blasting out superheated hydrogen, it blasts out nuclear fuel dust, essentially. At its most basic, the reactor is arranged so the fuel is embedded into thin disks where it is subcritical. As the disks rotate into the core, the fuel goes critical. The nuclear reactions cause the fuel to break free from the disks and into the core. The nuclear dust is then channeled out of the reactor, producing thrust. In this arrangement, a part of the disks would always be inside the reactor at all times, meaning there would always be reactions occurring, so thrust would be continuous. The rotation of the disks would also allow for them to cool as they are outside of the core, preventing them from overheating and damaging themselves more than they're supposed to. The core itself would be made of or coated with a neutron moderating material, in this case, to keep the reactor as light as possible, the moderator would probably be something like beryllium oxide or lithium hydride coating. The fission fragments will be ionized, and as such, can be controlled with magnetic fields and a magnetic nozzle. Another version of this concept is known as dusty plasma, first proposed by Rodney L. Clark and Robert B. Sheldon. This principle is roughly the same, but instead of keeping the fuel in disks, the fuel is suspended in nanoparticles that are contained in a magnetic trap. As the particles go critical and ionize, they are channeled out of the reactor core through a magnetic nozzle, producing thrust. The particles can also be decelerated and used for power generation, so the engine can be used for both propulsion and power. 
Dusty plasma can theoretically make the drive more efficient and remove some worries such as cooling and thermal management. A neutral gas can also be injected into the fission fragment stream, which would then be heated and expelled out with the rest. This would increase thrust and allow for the thrust to be adjustable as needed, with the added drawback of needing to bring along extra propellant. Mass injection can also be used in a solid-state fission fragment rocket, with one design I saw indicating lithium as both the moderator and propellant. The diagram just says lithium, it doesn't indicate an isotope or a hydride solution, so I'm not 100% sure on how that works. I guess a powder, or maybe it isn't a solution and they just omitted that? I don't know. I have done a lot of research on lithium because it could also be a key component to another propulsion concept I'm very much interested in, and I'll also cover in a future video. Anyways, back to Fission Fragment. What makes this drive so compelling for me is the numbers you start to get from its performance. We see things like 90% efficiency in its operation, exhaust speeds between 3 and 5% the speed of light, with a specific impulse that tops over 1 million seconds. Specific impulse is the measurement of efficiency of a reaction drive. The higher that number, the better it is at turning reaction mass into thrust. The Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters had a specific impulse of around 250 seconds. Ion drives have a specific impulse anywhere between 2,000 and 5,000 seconds, so 1 million seconds is exceptionally good. A fission fragment rocket with a mature engine that's been developed into good efficiency could also theoretically accelerate a vehicle up to 10% the speed of light. At that speed, the ship would take just over 40 years to reach Proxima Centauri, the next star over. Time dilation wouldn't be a huge deal at that speed. To a person on the ship and a person back on Earth, the difference in travel time would be like, what, two months? This is a simplification. I did some looking in math, and depending on acceleration times, it changes, so these are just rough figures. But yeah, about two months time dilation over 42 years. The thrust you would get out of a fission fragment rocket is low, but higher than an ion drive. Ion drives can get around 0.25 newtons, with experimental ones on the ground producing up to 5 newtons. Fission fragment rockets, depending on design, could theoretically reach from 40 newtons to 350 newtons of thrust, with gas injection versions potentially reaching up to 4,651 newtons. That is really impressive. However, gas injection does have a drawback in that it reduces specific impulse. There are different designs with different theoretical performances, but we'll look at this bimodal afterburner style configuration designed by Robert Werka. Running on just fission fragments, we are looking at 43 newtons of thrust with a specific impulse of 527,000 seconds. Using gas injection, the thrust jumps up to 4,651 newtons, but the specific impulse drops to 32,000 seconds. So, it really is a trade-off that depends on where you want to go. In this way, fission fragment engines aren't a one-size-fit-all arrangement. You really need to design a specific engine for a specific mission. For example, an afterburner-style engine with the higher thrust and lower specific impulse would be just fine for exploring the planets. Nuclear thermal engines like NERVA were made with the idea of going to Mars. NERVA had a specific impulse of 841 seconds and a thrust of 246,663 newtons. So, a fission fragment rocket with a thrust of 4,651 newtons and a specific impulse of 32,000 seconds would be fine. Acceleration and deceleration would be slower, but your propellant mass would also be smaller, so again, trade-offs. This engine would also work pretty good for missions like Jupiter and Saturn, maybe using a slightly different arrangement to boost the specific impulse a bit. Going further like Neptune, an afterburner-style fission fragment rocket could also probably work, especially if you grabbed a gravity assist along the way. Although I would probably still recommend the higher specific impulse versions, but that's just me. If you want to get out to the solar gravitational lens distance and station a telescope there to use the sun as a big light-bending lens to directly observe exoplanets, you would need to reach about 542 astronomical units, with 1 AU being the distance between the Earth and the sun. At this distance, you would just want to use a non-afterburner fission fragment rocket and just accept the lower thrust. If you want to go to Alpha Centauri, or really any star within a reasonable distance you can cover at 10% the speed of light, Let's say 10 light years, anything over that and it's probably not worth it until you can travel faster. 
you would for sure want to go with the pure fission fragments with the 1 million seconds of specific impulse. It would take a long time to accelerate up to 10% the speed of light, I'm talking years of constant acceleration and years of constant deceleration. I'm trying to find specifics, but since the numbers are variable and the thrusts are variable, it's not terribly easy to get specifics here. Point is, with this engine, distance is actually your friend. The longer the trip, the more time you spend in your coast phase. Of course, an important consideration for a fission fragment rocket is the fissile material used. In most configurations, the fuel of choice is uranium-235 and plutonium-239, a very expensive and politically uncomfortable material. Not that they are difficult to source or anything, any country with nuclear power infrastructure can do it, it's just something to consider. One concept proposed by George Chaplin at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in 1988 used americium-242m, a metastable version of americium-242. The concept was based on heating propellant from the fission of sub-micrometer-thin sheets of americium-242m. Some advantages of using americium-242m is the mass requirements would be 1% that of plutonium or uranium, producing a lightweight reactor. It also has the highest thermal fission cross-section of all known isotopes and a low critical mass. This basically means that it's very easy to induce sustained fission. A study in 2000 at CERN focused on using americium-242m as the nuclear fuel in a nuclear thermal rocket with promising results. As with everything, there are downsides, and this is no exception. Producing americium-242m is best accomplished in a fast neutron reactor, which aren't always available and they also pose a nuclear proliferation risk. In 2023, a NASA study was started into using aerogel as the carrier matrix for the nuclear fuel. This arrangement would allow for increased thermal conductivity and lower masses. But, being a NASA study in the current era, I'll just assume it'll go nowhere and be forgotten. Fission fragment rockets really are a neat concept that could offer performances for realistic robotic interstellar missions. For a trip to Alpha Centauri, sure, using high-powered lasers to push photon sails from 3 to 30% the speed of light is neat, and if we could get up to 30% the speed of light, that would reduce travel time significantly. But those are pretty much stuck as flyby missions on ultra-low-mass vehicles. Besides, most who talk about the photon sails to Alpha Centauri stay within 1-10% to the speed of light, with 3% kind of being the average. A mature fission fragment rocket not only could reach high velocities needed for a transit time lower than a century, but it would have the ability to slow down and enter into orbit of Proxima Centauri instead of just flying by. It would increase transit time, but the trade-offs of spending possibly decades in the system versus weeks is, in my opinion, very much worth it. Even locally, fission fragment rockets along with nuclear thermal propulsion could be very advantageous to human planetary exploration. Saturn's moon Titan is very interesting, and we could totally get there if we tried. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Please feel free to like and subscribe, or tell me that I'm wrong and annoying in the comments below. I will be back with more videos like this covering other deep space propulsion methods that are within our grasp and that I find fascinating.